This conference will now be recorded. All right, so welcome back everybody to the second in our series of roundtable talks um, with Advanced Behavioral Health's DEI committee. Um, last time we talked about um, what it was like to be black or African American in the United States. This is a this is a series that we're doing on race in the United States and in mental health. And today's topic is actually going to focus on being Asian or Asian American in the United States and perceptions of being Asian and Asian American in the United States. So we have two guests with us here today. We have Jennifer Chen and also Haley Lawrence. Welcome, you guys. We're so happy you could be here to join us. Um, basically, as it works, if you were here for the last roundtable talk, I'll pose a question to the group, and then anybody can respond um, with their own personal answers. OK? So the, the question that I'll be posing to everybody today is, when did you first know you were Asian? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Again, thank you so much for having um, us join and be a part of this series. Um, again, my name is Jennifer Chen, and I am one of the site directors um, for our Prince George's County office location. Um, so in, in thinking about this question and realizing when I was first Asian, um, I grew up in a pretty diverse community. Um, and so um, you know, I it, it was just, you know, a mix of, you know, um, of Blacks, of Asians, Hispanics, whites. And so I didn't really look at race in particular growing up as a young kid. It probably was until for me personally, um, my parents enrolled me in Chinese school. So probably when I was like five or six and I got enrolled in Chinese school, um, it was on the weekends. I think it was like every Sunday. And I remember having to, um, to um, you know, uh, share a story in Chinese. And so I remembered uh, practicing in Chinese, the story about, you know, the, the three little pigs and the, you know, big bad wolf um, and kind of presenting that to my group. And it was through kind of Chinese school that I learned about my language. I learned about um, our, our cultural, you know, customs and values, and they would do a lot of kind of different fun activities aside from learning the language and writing um, Chinese, um, you know, just the different kind of cultural activities they would do and painting and things like that. So for me, that was when I was like, oh, this is what it means to be, you know, specifically Chinese. Hi, I'm Haley. I'm a therapist at Montgomery County. Thank you for having me. So for me, I was actually adopted when I was three months old from China, and I was raised by a single mother who's from the South. So all of my family is actually from Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, like the full Southern Midwestern type. And so I grew up with a lot of little diversity. And so from a very young age, I knew that I was Chinese and I knew I was different and that's something my mom never tried to hide she always tried to like encourage us to know about our culture and I actually she had us join some Chinese schooling too to try to help us keep like the language and stuff um I was never very good at it so it didn't really stick but um I also grew up in Bethesda so Bethesda is a very and I went to Walt Whitman High School it's a very non like not very diverse area. And so from a very young age, I recognized that I was Chinese, but I guess it never really kind of set in with me and never really bothered me because I guess I, oh, not bothered, not the word, but it never bothered me that I was different or like I was a different race. It kind of just was there. I feel like up until recently, honestly, like a couple months ago, I was gonna take a trip and I went to Alabama to see one of my friends and that's when I first had like actual worry and concern about like racism or discrimination um, because I was so scared because of all the Corona stuff that I was going to be like discriminated against or like I was going to be a victim of like a hate crime, especially down in the South. And so I had like a lot of anxiety and panic surrounding that trip. And that was really the first time I ever looked at myself and I thought, wow, like I've never really experience luckily like any racism or discrimination based on being Chinese but it's been so scary recently I'm like what if this suddenly happens and I have a twin sister and I worry a lot about her when she's out doing different things like it's just something that crosses my mind now um mm -hmm. and it never did before so I guess really recently is when I've really kind of noticed it the most 
Yeah, I mean, I would definitely agree with you too, Haley. For me also, you know, kind of being Asian and kind of my growing up and my life experiences, fortunately for me, I hadn't had too many um, negative encounters or experiences experiences. Of course, sometimes people will come up to me and say um, <clears throat> in Chinese, oh, ni hao, or, you know, say something like that. And I always kind of just like laughed and kind of moved, moved along, you know. Um, but it wasn't until this year after the pandemic, um, and specifically, I think, when our last president kind of labeled um, the coronavirus, the Kung flu virus, right? Um, and uh, now worrying about my own safety, my parents' safety, which I've never thought about before until now. Um, and then I also went to graduate school in New York and I loved you know, New York City for its diversity, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this past year hearing so many um, hate crimes and out of New York City too, in Chinatown, you know, New York City was is always a place that I love to go back and visit, right? But right now, I don't feel comfortable going to visit New York City because I'm afraid. What if I'm on the subway and someone just, you know, because I'm Asian, come and attack me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a I think that it's kind of impossible for us to do this meeting on being like Asian in the United States without talking about some of the recent responses mm -hmm. to to Asians and coronavirus and all that stuff. Um, and I do kind of want to move there. But before we actually do that, I kind of wanted to get some other people's like input or or ideas about perceptions of being Asian or how did you know you were or were not Asian? How did you learn about um, Asian people? Because I think one thing I noticed that's a little bit different in both what um, Jennifer and Haley said um, which is different from what we talked about last time is that a lot of this relationship um, with being Asian and I I feel this because I'm also from immigrant parents but it's or this relationship with like culture or like language that's kind of some some way that you learn that you're a little bit different than Americans and I'm just curious from other people in the group um, what were your perceptions of being of Asians or Asians growing up um, being Asian in general mm -hmm. So for me, I'm actually a military brat and I did actually stay in Japan for about two or three years. So I was enmeshed in their culture for quite some time. Um, and we did learn a lot of like cultural things of significance to them. Uh, very mild mannered culture in general, just the entire Asian um, culture in general. But um, Specifically in Japan, we did learn how to speak um, Japanese. We learned how to do a lot of origami. We learned about their customs and everything when we were growing up. And then we kind of moved over here or to Florida. Everybody was pretty much uh, diverse where we came from. Then came to Maryland. I went to a very diverse high school. Um, but in the end, like our high school class picture was actually very much segregated, even though our school is super diverse and I had a hall of nations and everything. Um, I dated Asian people. I date, uh, I had a lot of Asian friends. I still do. Um, and the one thing that is very much dominant with them is that they're very mild mannered and they're very strict with their culture and everything like that. And so what I've noticed is that they don't really, um, you know, they don't, they're not, uh, they're not confrontational. And I don't know if it was just something that was taught to them or what it is, but from what I've seen, I don't think any of my friends have really experienced uh, anything growing up that was negative toward them and for because of their race until this year and last year specifically. I did have a girl who was adopted as well um, in my Girl Scout troop, and she was raised by Caucasians, but they um, made sure that she learned her culture. There are actually two. But the school she went to, um, she actually got a lot of backlash from some of her peers. So it was a matter of trying to have help her. And this was like maybe seven or eight years ago. And she was going through a lot of struggles. And so was her, her peer within my Girl Scout troop. And her mother, myself, and some other people came together. because, And the school did. They were very helpful to this little girl and to her friend because both of them were adopted. One was from Cambodia and the other one was from China, I believe. Um, so it was, they did experience it, unfortunately, pretty young. Um, it doesn't sound like Haley and Jennifer did, for the, which is great, but it does sound like um, a lot of my friends right now are a little bit terrified about um, their parents 
specifically, you know, uh, traveling. And it's not because of COVID, it's because of the backlash that they could face. And it's really scary. So they've been teaching their parents a lot of things and then they're telling them not to come and they're actually willing to fly out to them or just drive them over here and stuff like that, which is kind of scary. When COVID first just came out, you know, one of my friends went to Costco and some Caucasian people pretty much said very derogatory things toward them. And she was like, wow, that's like a really first time in her life that she's ever experienced anything very negative because of our last president and because of COVID in general. So. Can I jump in? Go for uh, it. So I'm Kay Schlatter. I'm from the Montgomery County office. Um, so I, I had a lot of Asian friends growing up um, when I was younger, um, but I didn't really know like very much about their culture until I became an adult. And so, um, you know, to me when I was younger, it was just like, oh, they eat different food than I do and it's delicious. And like, you know, they would, you know, their family would always cook for me and stuff and it was so great. Um, but that was like the extent of my um, exposure to their culture, which is, which is, you know, not great. Like there's obviously so much more. Um, but then also, you know, a lot of my friends, like like you said, haven't experienced these like overt um, racist experiences. But like I remember growing up, you know, my family, a lot of them fought in like Vietnam, and like I just remember hearing like derogatory comments about Asians in general and kind of lumping them all together. And so like I had to kind of explain to these family members, like, no, this friend is Vietnamese, she's not Chinese. Stop t stop saying that, or you know, just like just like comments that they wouldn't say in front of other people. But I, I just remember growing up, like hearing these negative comments and it wasn't like someone was trying to be like mean, but they thought it was like a, like a funny comment or whatever, or they didn't understand. And, and it like, it took a long time for me to explain to my dad, like, no, you cannot call someone Oriental. And this is why, <laughs> like, you know, um, so, you know, maybe that it just wasn't like, in the media as much growing up for us, you know? Um, and I think like you guys were saying, what's been going on with coronavirus, I think it's kind of like highlighted some stuff that has been there all along and maybe it's just a little more overt now. I don't know. Yeah, I would agree with Kate as well. For me growing up, um, I didn't really see race uh, like that. I was just playing amongst my peers and my high school. Uh, group, we we were pretty diverse. We had um, one Caucasian girl, we had one Pakistani girl, we had one um, Hispanic girl, and then we had one Filipino girl. And amongst our group, uh, you know, whenever we came up with plans, I would always be like, well, I already went out once this week. I don't know if I can go out another time. Whereas my Filipino friend, she would be like, well, I have Asian parents. Like, I don't know if I can go. Uh, and that was that seemed to be one of her uh, phrases that she would say no matter what or what kind of when uh, we planned on hanging out or even if we haven't hung out in two weeks, she would always say, no, I can't have Asian parents. I don't know yet. I have to find out until like the night before. And again, to me, I was I didn't understand at the time because me having Hispanic parents, I was like, well, I get it. Like Hispanic parents, they're strict. Asian parents must be strict um but in in the hispanic world it they were more strict just because they expected us to be obedient um whereas with my filipino friend she was not only uh, expected to be obedient but she was also expected to be perfect and that wasn't something that i in my household experienced uh, so whenever she'd say you know i don't know I, I i had to i had to ask my asian parents i'm just like well i mean there's a chance. I mean, I feel like we haven't gone out, but again, I didn't take into account, you know, her her room, how clean the house was, you know, how her grades were up, and, and she would really stress on just how perfect and neat everything had to be. Um, and just like with with Kate, I didn't really know until you know my my young adult uh, adult years where I really got to understand the difference between a Hispanic culture or the Black culture or the Asian culture. And it's just all, it's all different, same in some aspects, but definitely different. And that perfection is something that I, I just, I couldn't understand at, at a younger age. Um, is that something that you, Haley and Jen, experienced um, growing up, that perfection 
I have to have everything in its place kind of feeling. Oh, Haley, do you want to go? You can go first. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yes, that that was kind of, I mean, that really nails it, right? Um, at least <clears throat> in my family, um, you know, especially coming from my mom, it was always about uh, performing and getting straight A's and doing really well in school. Um, it's, you know, kind of, you know, it, it makes me think about the minority, um, model minority myth, right? And this kind of, um, in some ways that kind of, I think, protected me somewhat from kind of negative encounters because I was so focused growing up on my grades and doing well in school. Because I think culturally um, for me, um, that was emphasized, right? And mm -hmm. so I was always focused on school and doing well in school. And I, so I think my peers, um, regardless of race, um, they just knew me kind of like, oh, like Jen, she's smart, you know? So like being kind of like, the smart one kind of, I think, protected me in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, but kind of, it wasn't until I, I got older to really recognize um, that learning about the model minority and how actually that's really hurtful. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in some ways to kind of like growing up in my experiences, I think when I was younger in high school, you know, I really, my focus was so much on school and not so much you know, my peer relationships, and I had, you know, a few close friends, and I, I, I felt like I knew everyone um, in school for the most part, but my relationships were very kind of, you know, just more on an academic level, right, and not not having these deep personal relationships with a lot of folks, because um, I was so focused on school and doing well, and, um, but I think, again, that kind of protected me throughout that time and throughout that experience, um, but it, you know, in, in addition to like the, the perfectionism, it's also just kind of this, this quietness, right? Um, being more reserved. And for me is like, you know, I just kind of felt more shy to, to kind of speak up um, or, you know, like I think Vanita mentioned, you know, not being very confrontational, right? Not trying to initiate any issues or conflicts and just always kind of, you know, you know, keeping to myself and just being quiet and listening to other people and and kind of, you know, pleasing other people too, you know, making sure we all get along. And I know in the Asian culture, you know, um, getting along with others is, is a, you know, a value, right? And, you know, avoiding conflict and things like that. So I think looking back, seeing how the Asian culture has really influenced me and, um, but now recognizing some of you know, some ways that it's not so helpful, right? And it's not until I got older that I realized, look, I don't, I can speak up and, and that's okay. You know, I can assert how I feel and what I think is what on whatever issue. Um, so I think, you know, especially my position now, I've really learned to, to be more assertive, right? Um, and, and then again, seeing how that perfectionism too can be um, in terms of the mental health world can can really be devastating, right? Um, creating a lot of anxiety and stress and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, it's really actually in terms of the Asian community and the, the mental health in the Asian community, because there's so much pressure to perform well and get three days and be the best at everything. Um, I mean, you just see numbers of Asian folks struggling with anxiety, depression, um, suicidality, but then it's also not getting the help that they need because of this being quiet, right? Not letting people know what's going on. So I have kind of similar but different experience. Like growing up, I guess I never was felt the pressure to, you know, do like be perfect or overachieve. Like my mom, she definitely pushed my sister and I to do well in school and like try our hardest, but I never felt that overwhelming pressure to be like perfect or to fall into that. And actually now thinking about it, I, that is one thing that I actually used to always get commented on was, you know, if I had a couple Asian friends and they always be like, Oh, you're not really Asian. Like you don't mm -hmm. have, you don't know what it's like, or like, 
my friends, I always would, when we would have to like sometimes in assignments, like say what we were and I'd be like, oh, I'm Chinese. They're like, oh, you're not, you're fake Asian. You're not a real Asian. Like all mm -hmm. these comments and it would be very invalidating to like who I was and my identity. Um, I hadn't even, I haven't even thought about that in so long, but I remember that growing up um, was I would always be criticized and I would do a lot of extracurricular activities. Like I, and I went out a lot, like I did cheerleading and I was going, I was on dance squad and I went out a lot. And so I would always get point out like, oh, your mom lets you do that and comments like that. And I never mm -hmm. really understood why, mm -hmm. but, you know, thinking about it and, you know, as I grew older, I realized it was because a lot of people, I guess, if they didn't know my mom, they assumed I had an Asian mother and they were very confused and distraught as to why I was always out doing different things, you know, not necessarily taking all AP classes or things like that. Like people always used to make those comments to me. And mm -hmm. I guess I never really processed it as it being necessarily, you know, and um, like a discriminatory or like racial type of thing. But as I got older, I definitely noticed like it was definitely like invalidating one who I was and like putting me in these boxes and you know just mm -hmm. discrimination in general and stereotyping mm -hmm. it's so it's so interesting to hear your your comments Haley because I'm thinking so much of this I feel like has been there's been a lot of crossover in my own life and then some parts are really different but so I'm half Middle Eastern and I remember mm -hmm. um when I was a kid like looking at where Armenia was on the map and seeing that it was in Central Asia and then being like, oh, I'm Asian, cool. <laughs> and then people <laughs> being like, you're not Asian. And I'm like, yes, I am. Like, go look on the map. <laughs> and so like, it just, it's, it's interesting now to like think about that because of like how ridiculous it all is. Like, yeah, I mean, and then like as an adult sort of like, I have sort of, I identify now as West Asian. I mean, I think especially kind of moving away from the term Middle Eastern, which is like a term of colonization, people who are Middle Eastern are starting to identify as West Asian, which is even expanding this idea of what Asian is even more. Um, but it, it's interesting because um, Jen, a lot of what you were saying about this like model minority myth, I really identify uh, with being Middle Eastern, like I, there was huge pressure on me to like perform in a lot of ways. I played competitive violin as a child and like pretty much every single person like in, in my orchestras and all that was East Asian and then, and then me. And I think that I, I felt more like everybody than I did different. And so it's interesting to think back to know myself then be like thinking I'm Asian, but a different kind of Asian, if that makes sense. Um, but, but Haley, I think unlike you, people aren't looking at me and being like, oh, you probably have a tiger mom or like whatever, like ridiculous stereotypes. Um, so it's just mm -hmm. interesting to hear all those crossovers. Um, one thing I, I think that is really important for us to talk about and another thing I sort of identified with is this idea of like, of like how you, you are different or how you are Asian or how you are a race in the United States, I think as a Middle Eastern person, those of us who are Middle Eastern, we really know what it's like to, to be perceived as one thing and then be perceived as another, like people's attitude towards Middle Eastern seriously shifted in the United States after 9-11. And I, I'm wondering, you know, like in, in some ways before then, we were also considered kind of like a model minority. We work really hard. We like, you know, do good things. And then after 9-11, um, after the only use of the term Middle Eastern was like to talk about people being terrorists or violent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if there are parallels that you guys see anybody in sort of the way Asians are being perceived before and after coronavirus um, and, and how that's sort of impacting people's perceptions of being Asian and also people's experience of being Asian. Okay, well, so personally, I I think amongst the Asian culture, I, just based on where I grew up and how I grew up, <clears throat> I think there were a lot of internalized stereotypes that Asians probably already knew because I had a lot of friends that would literally joke about the stereotypes that, and, and so like, you know, when you say like, let, that they don't really know that they're very reserved, they are, they know they, those, those stereotypes exist. So I believe that they've all, and they've known for a long time, it's just they don't really vocalize a lot of things. Um, so I, I do think it's out there and it exists. It's just, you know, a matter of how vocal people will be about it and, and within their own culture too. 
So. I think that the pandemic definitely is going to change how people look at Asian Americans forever, honestly, or for a very, not maybe not forever, that's a little maybe dramatic, but like a very long time, like kind mm-hmm. of how like 9-11, like you were saying, um, because I mean, it's great. I mean, even as the pandemic is still di- is dying down now, thankfully, you still see all of the memes going around about like the, Ch- the Wu-Tang virus in China and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. You still hear about all the hate crimes. Like, I feel like this is something that's just going to be like held against you know, Asians now, like forever, it'll just be held over their heads. And so I feel like it's definitely going to shift, um, you know, culture and stuff and how people look at Asian Americans. And it's definitely going to make me like more aware of myself um, and just where I'm going and who I'm going around and like different situations. And I live in Frederick. And so we don't really have our mask mandate is definitely very much more ease than in Montgomery County. And so sometimes I don't wear my mask if I go into a grocery store, if I go into the gym and I catch myself thinking, I'm like, do you think people are going to think that I'm going to give them Corona Mm -hmm. because I'm not wearing my mask, Mm -hmm. you know, and tons of other people will not be wearing their mask, but I will specifically think because I'm Mm -hmm. Chinese, they're going to think, you're now another coronavirus is going to happen because you're not wearing your mask. Um, so I definitely think it's shifted the perception of Asian Americans and it's going to stick around for a good amount of time. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a matter of the media too, its influence and its impact on this whole thing because it, it's, it's gotten ridiculous to the point where people are worried about their safety, you know? Mm-hmm. No, I think, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, no, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> I was just, just going to ask, um, you know, when we look at this country, obviously, the last four years, uh, the rhetoric that was coming out of the, um, you know, administration was very um, negative. And I'm just wondering, do other countries um, who didn't have like that same kind of rhetoric from their administrations, are they having such um, like hate crimes the way that we are? Or are we kind of above the the average um country with that right now i'm just wondering does anybody know i don't know but that's a great question Mm -hmm. no i think it's also really kind of like important to realize you know hate crimes against whether asian black or you know any minority group it's it's been around forever since day one you know Mm -hmm. and i think the pandemic has really just brought everything to light you know Mm -hmm. um and brought you know ultimately it all comes down to race, right? And it brought everything up to light. And so um, seeing how, again, I think the, the one silver lining, I think from all of this is that, you know, kind of Benina touched on, you know, Asians being more reserved and not speaking up quite, you know, and, and for, I think that's kind of whether it's cultural, but, you know, from again, Chinese, Asian people um, from all, different countries in Asia. I mean, we've been in the United States for a really long time too. I mean, I think it was, you know, the Asian immigrants who also helped build the rail, railroads across the U.S. And mm-hmm. again, not learning so much about the, the history of Asian Americans and in, in schools too, which is frustrating, right? Um, but, um, you know, we've, again, never really, whenever there's conflict or something, we, we just stay quiet. We, well, so we can let it pass. So we don't have to create an issue out of it and we can continue moving on. But I think more and more of us are speaking out um, and being assertive and saying, this is not okay, right? Treating us, you know, um, acting, you know, conducting like violent crimes against us is not okay, right? None of this is okay. And then also working with our allies, right? And supporting one another and and showing up for each other. Um, I think that's one thing that I, I do appreciate at least from everything that's come out of this past year, so. Yeah. I think social media in such a way is like a double-edged sword in that sense, because I think mm-hmm. it shows a lot of allies for a lot of different groups, both mm-hmm. like, you know, the big Black Lives Matter stuff that goes on in the Af- and Asian American things that are going on right now. And even with Palestine and stuff, like it brings together so mm-hmm. many different people and shows allies, but it also creates such hate I think too it creates like people bandwagging on top of people or people just following along and retweeting and re-going on something that they have no idea what's even being posted mm-hmm. or understanding it's just um pure like let me just reshare this this seems funny or this seems cool and they're not understanding how it's contributing to the mm-hmm. bigger problem mm-hmm. 
I think um, with the with our younger clients and them being so into social media and they use it for, you know, it's good, good parts. And, and they also use it with its bad parts, but they're not really aware of the bad parts that, you know, they're seeing or they're reposting or anything like that. And so with social media being mentioned, um, I know with me and going into the field, um, anytime I, my, my mentees mention something that they see on Twitter or that they read and they go, I don't know, I saw it on, uh, uh, on a Twitter post. I was like, well, did you really look into it? Did you go ahead and use Google? Did you really like read the whole thing from top to bottom? And I try to empower them as much that, you know, they have a laptop that fits in their pocket. Use it. Like you, one thing that you read from your friend, like, yeah, you might agree with your friend and you guys have these similar similarities, you know, outside Friday through Sunday, but you know, you guys are so different. So you might want to read more into whatever it is you're reading on social media, Google it, real ask your parents, ask, you know, adults, like ask questions because social media can show you the best parts and social media can show you the lies and the bad parts. Um, so I really try to take it into, you know, into the field of just having them be much more knowledgeable on what they're seeing on social media, especially with everything that's going on and the pandemic and having that extra time and that extra excuse to be like, well, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to be on my phone and total on my thumb. But like use that time wisely, really give yourself that knowledge on everything that you're reading with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the Asian community, with, you know, why the administration was calling it the Kung Fu flu virus, all that. Um, so I think that is really important that we, as adults, bring it to the young ones. Because um, a lot of us had said that we were aware of it at a younger age, and even those, Jen and Haley, you said you, you weren't aware until you're older and an adult. Um, and I find that to be a common theme um, and so it's, I think social media can be used more as a great aspect if we just were to teach them at a younger age. I agree. I think um, it's, it's part of this conversation is so interesting, especially in, also in relationship to our last round table talk, but thinking about how like uh, racism actually also changes and shifts and the way people are experiencing racism changing and shifting because of events like 9-11 or coronavirus but then also like you guys were talking about with social media like social media has really changed the way that people experience racism um, and experience um, not even, like not even just kids but also like media and how adults are consuming media and racism through media um, and so I, I want to kind of shift the conversation there. Thank you for starting that, Tamara. But like, how are you guys, I guess, how are people noticing um, racism against Asian people or, or with Asian clients, mental health stuff? How are people internalizing that? Are you having conversations about coronavirus and, and how it's prompted some of this racism? What are people's experience of, of delving into this subject with clients or in the mental health, mental health field generally? So I don't, I don't have any, um, I have some West Asian clients, but they obviously aren't facing the same backlash. Um, but I have some clients who are not Asian who have said some of these things like, you know, derogatory things about Asians and, and all of that. And so like Tamara said, I feel like it's, you know, my responsibility to help educate them and to help them realize like what the reliable source and what's not. And to kind of talk about it and just you know do some change talk with him and like help motivate them like tomorrow was saying to to realize like what is a correct or what is an actual factual source a reliable source rather than just vomit from social media you know mm -hmm. yeah i also don't have any asian clients anymore but i have a lot of clients who are into anime and I have taken those opportunities <laughs> to highlight where it started and where it originated to, and then, you know, that sometimes does lead into the conversation. And most of my clients have, because of their age, they've basically said that they don't condone at all, like what's going on within the Asian community and they're very against it. And they've been very vocal about it, which is great. Um, 
unfortunately, a lot of my clients have also faced their own stuff, you know, because most of them are black or Hispanic or of that nature. So I think from a mental health perspective, I, it's mainly, I've been dealing with it with my friends because it's just progressively, like within the last few months, it's gotten a little bit worse for them, um, which is odd because it's kind of shifted from last summer to, you know, it being mainly about black. I guess it started with like the pandemic and the Kung flu virus um, name, but then it shifted to just Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And then now we're back to Asian hate again. And it's just like, now they are, they are, you know, again, very reserved, but now they're, they're upset, they're worried, they're scared. And it's like a matter of just checking in on them a lot and kind of talking through a lot of stuff with them, as opposed to like more of my clients. It's, it's so interesting that like, you know, we said that and, and most of us are like, oh, wait, we don't have any Asian clients. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I think that that's something that we as practitioners in the mental health field need to be thinking about more. Like, is that mm -hmm. maybe some of it related to what Jen was saying earlier about people not accessing or, or wanting or mental health services or there being cultural stereotypes about that? Mm -hmm. Or are we doing a poor job as providers and practitioners, like making our services seem accessible to Asian people? And I think at advanced behavioral health, that might be a question that we're asking ourselves um, and looking into because it's it's really interesting that we're having this conversation and then being like, oh, actually, we don't have any Asian clients, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I'm so not sure if it's more cultural or if it's based like because I know in the Hispanic culture and the African American culture, it's like no, your problems stay within your own home and there you don't have any mental health issues and like you're fine. You know, so I don't know if that's the same case with the Asian culture or not. I, I can suspect because I've had friends like that. So I don't know. And I've had to force a couple of friends to go into therapy, but I don't know. So. But it's interesting, Benita, too, because, you know, that's that's rhetoric in my family as well, my Hispanic family as well. Um, but I'm thinking like, yeah, that's rhetoric in African-American and Hispanic communities, but we still have a ton of like African American and Hispanic clients, right? So why are Asian clients not accessing services? It's something for us to think about and look into, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think there's definitely a, a major stigma um, still um, in the Asian community, um, again, because I think it, again, being so reserved and you know our our issues stay within our family or we don't we don't let it out also i think this pressure again to be perfect right um so we come across as perfect we have it all together so we don't let anyone know that inside like we may be really struggling um so i mean i have a couple of asian clients that i'm i'm currently working with um, you know, again, and I, I oftentimes I see the common themes of the pressure, right? The pressure to perform well, to be the best at whatever we're doing, right? Um, and then certainly, of course, this pandemic and coming in and kind of impacting all of us and being concerned about our, our friends, our loved ones, our family members. Um, you know, again, me personally, you know, my parents are at Columbia Mall. I mean, they go to Columbia Mall every now and then. And I get worried every time, I'm like, guys, be careful, you know, mm -hmm. and watch the surroundings. I've never had to say that, you know, before. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's, um, you know, going back to mental health, though, I, I think it's, I think there's definitely a, a need, just like with any group, right? And, you know, as long as I think if you're human, we can all benefit from some therapy, right? But I think specifically for the Asian community, it can be more challenging because of all that pressure that's put on the Asian community um, and, you know, that fear of showing weakness too, right? So if I ask for help, um, is that a sign of weakness versus actually, no, it's a sign of courage and strength, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I know um, I'm also on a, a provider list, um, specifically with Asian providers, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, and so sometimes we'll get, you know, phone calls from, you know, different, um, different folks in the Asian community, you know, asking for services. I think it's a good step forward that, you know, more and more, I think Asian um, folks in the Asian community are reaching out and, and getting connected. So I think that's so awesome that there is a provider list like that. Like I had mm -hmm. no idea that that existed. I think mm -hmm. another interesting point for our at least advanced behavioral health and um, just why maybe we don't have as many Asian um, clients. It might also be how, you know, class and like how un like society um, 
has like marginalized different groups into lower classes versus, you know, I feel like, and tell me if I'm wrong, I feel like Asian communities or Asian cultures, you know, because they do have such a strong need to be perfect and need to succeed, they often go for higher paying, you know, jobs and careers. They work their, they work through like medical school and doctorate school, and they have such a pressure to reach all those high, high, high points that I feel like that also could be just like a barrier to us maybe having as many a high of a population of Asian clients is because we primarily serve people on Medicaid. And so I feel like there's not as many people on Medicaid within that realm. And tell me if I'm wrong, if people think I'm wrong, but that's just what I kind of think of maybe. Well, even, even getting on Medicaid might be something that they wouldn't want to do because again, they're striving to be perfect and, and allowing mm -hmm. that assistance may be something that they're not able to accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it also goes to education. Jen mentioned earlier that there wasn't a lot of cult focus growing up on the, you know, on the Asian community in general. And I think that's kind of the same because right now there's been a big push for mental health awareness. But when I've seen all this stuff in the social media and even when I was in grad school and stuff, they do kind of focus on, okay, well, this group has significant mental health issues because of, you know, cultural norms or because of how their culture kind of depicts mental health in general. And you mainly hear it about Hispanics and Blacks, Hispanics and Blacks a lot, and you see the differences and everything and the statistics and stuff out there for all the different mental health issues per cultural group. And what happens is with that, you know, other groups are just like, okay, we're not really here. So there's no real evidence about like Asian culture because everybody, like she said, every, if you're human, you're probably suffering, you're going through suffering, we can all benefit from it. But mm -hmm. I think that right now it's just not really highlighted amongst the Asian community. I think it's also really important to to kind of also understand the differences within the Asian community and you know just you know the Asian community it's such a broad diverse community actually I mean the different cultural norms between um, folks from Japan folks from Vietnam Korea China mm -hmm. Taiwan um, Thailand um, Laos I mean Philip the Philippines I mean all over um, you know the, the Asia community and and, and each group is is so different, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and class is also so different amongst within the groups and among the groups too. You know, so um, I think it's always just it's so important just to be aware of you know, um, you know, a kind of you know how we you know being aware of ourselves, of course, and then aware of you know the people we may interact with, right? And and sometimes I know growing up, we would, you know, people were asked like, wait, are you Chinese? Or are you Korean? Or are you um, Vietnamese? You know, and always having to kind of explain to them and then explain to them the difference, right? And some people kind of just lump us all up under the same umbrella when actually there's a lot of differences, right? Jen, is that an appropriate question? Like if I meet somebody who's Asian, is that something I can just say like, well, where, you know, I like recently I've heard like you shouldn't be asking people like where are you from like well where are you really from you know what I mean like I like how is that even something that like is appropriate to breach and gen and you know casual conversation I mean for me personally I don't I don't mind if you ask me where I'm from or what my ethnic background is because if you aren't familiar with the Asian community it, it can be very hard to kind of know where someone may um, where their origins might be. I mean, even myself and I have such a diverse group of friends from all over parts of Asia um, and it can be hard to, to know. Um, so sometimes I think being, when, when it's coming from a genuine place of curiosity and wanting to get to know someone um, because you care and you wanna learn more about them as a person, um, mm -hmm. you know, then I, you know, I don't mind. I think that's one of those things that, in I mean, even as, even that having these conversations is so interesting because we're like, like down with stereotypes. But then the question is, what is it like to be Asian? <laughs> it's like I mean, Jen, you can probably only speak on what it's like to be Chinese, not Asian. You know what I mean? Um, but there is this way in which, like, I think Asian Asians in general get lumped as Asians, or even as Chinese when somebody's not Chinese. Um, and that mm -hmm. is kind of something we deal with within this particular type of racism. But in response to Kate, I, I you know, thinking about your question, I think that's one of those things that is like 
kind of person to person, right? Like some people are going to be like, wow, you're interested in who I am. Great. And other people are going to be like, why did you ask me that? You know? And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like with therapy, right? And you know, everybody that we engage with each of our clients, there has to be sort of some type of rapport or intuitive sense that we, that we work with people through and figure out what do people feel comfortable with and what do people not feel comfortable with? Because just as blacks are not a monolith, which we talked about last time, Asian people are not a monolith and some people are going to like that question and some people are not. And I think maybe that's kind of the takeaway from today is that like everybody's an individual and like everybody's going to have really different relationships with um, who they are, how they became who they are, mental health, how they're accessing services, all the stuff we kind of touched on today. So it feels kind of like that's a good ending point. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to contribute today or say before we kind of close out? Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Haley, for coming and joining us. Thank you, thank you everybody who um, is watching this and uh, we really appreciate everybody's like participation and feedback and attendance again if you liked what you saw today or you had more questions or you didn't like something you saw today or you wanted to contribute something um let the dei committee know um we will we do we do send out um this access to this video in an email and you can always respond to that email or directly connect with one of us so uh, thanks everybody appreciate it and hopefully we'll see you for our next round table talk um thanks everybody take care thank you well bye